Yeah. Merchants of Doom and Gloom. It is April 9th. This panel number is 4612, and we, this is the UMC Center Ballroom. Michael Elliott is the President and Chief Executive Officer of ONE, the global campaigning and advocacy organization fighting poverty and disease. Prior to joining ONE in 2011, Elliott served as editor of both Time International and Newsweek International, and as political editor of, and the Washington Bureau Chief of The Economist. Elliot was a columnist for the Global Economy for Fortune magazine and has written and presented many television documentaries that have been broadcast all over the world. He is also the author of four books. Richard Argood is a journalism professor at Rutgers University Camden and the University of North Dakota. He is the former public editor of the Philadelphia Daily News where he spent 29 years in jobs ranging from police reporter to rock critic to editorial page editor. Cool. His newspaper writing has been honored with the Pulitzer Prize, three American Society of Newspaper Editors Distinguished Writing Awards, the Scripps Howard Walker Stone Award, and a National Headliner Award. Juliana Furlano is the creator, host, and executive producer of the primetime news and talk show, The Juliana Furlano Show, and is host and creator of the award-winning political news satire and parody series, Absurdity Today. Forlano has served as, the, as a behavioral psychotherapist and an empowerment coach for private clients for over 10 years. She teaches journalism and script writing at Brooklyn College. Forlano appears regularly on TV and radio programs and has given performances at President Obama's inaugural ball, the Friars Club New York, the Democratic National Convention, and other notable venues. John Sinton is a serial media entrepreneur and has managed, owned, and operated shows, radio stations, networks, and allied businesses. In 2002, sensing a growing market for political talk, he created and was the founding president of Air America Radio, which represented the birth of organized progressive talk on radio. In early 2011, Sinton co-founded the smartphone app Progressive Voices, PV, which aggregates all progressive content that is seen, heard, or read. In 2012, PV launched a streaming radio service, the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn. Welcome, everybody. Michael drew, drew the uh, short straw, so he's going to get started here <laughs> before us. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Erica. Erica and um, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I got in uh, late last night um, to Boulder. Uh, I'm only here for a little more than a day. Uh, I first came to this incredible conference 28 years ago. That's a long, long, long time ago when I was slimmer, younger, and had less gray hair. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely fantastic to be back. You know, I, I, I go to, moderate, and speak at conferences all over the world, from Davos to St. Petersburg to China, and uh, you've built uh, an extraordinary thing here uh, in uh, the combination of the community and the university that you've managed to put together for so many years. So it's fan fantastic to be back after a four-year gap. In fact, Richard and I were just catching up. You know, we see each other every four years and say, hey, man, what are you doing? So the last time, I, like clockwork, exactly. And, and, I, and I should also say, great to be here with this absolutely murderous row of, uh, of, uh, of talent. Uh, uh, I mean, jo when John started Air America, um, I was on one of the very first jo shows, John, that. do you remember, with, uh, with, with the then comedian uh, and now senator uh, from Minnesota, um, uh, who, uh, who um, uh, we had a kind of good long, good long chat right. about that. Um, anyway, it's great, great to be here with these three. So I, I spent nearly 30 years uh, in the media, and now I'm not. Now I'm not. For the last four years, I've been uh, completely out of it. Uh, I run. I, I should ask, just as a, as a prefatory thing, if you don't mind, Erica, uh, because I'm going to be a little boring for, for some <laughs> of you, how many were you at my... How many of you were at my plenary a couple of hours ago? Any of you? Okay, you're going to hear some of the same stuff, so there's not that many of you. Oh, but, um, my apologies. Uh, just like we were always taught in journalism to sell every story three times, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, recycling some of my stuff at, um, at uh, CWA panels. So I was, I was in the media for 30 years, and, and now I'm not. Now I run uh, a, 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 an international NGO that uh, does advocacy and campaigning work on, uh, on poverty and preventable disease. Uh, the lobbies governments to provide money to fight AIDS, malaria, malnutrition, what have you. Uh, an organization who's sort of founding genius and, and inspiration and, you know, I suppose my boss 
uh, is Bono, the rock star and activist and all around remarkable person. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what I do now. I'm not, I'm not in the media. And when I was in the media, when I was an editor and a columnist, which I was for a long, long time, if I'd seen uh, a, uh, a title of a seminar like this, you know, the media doom and gloom, uh, I would have done a Pavlovian reaction. I would have oh. said, oh, there they, you know, there they go again. You know, I mean, they just want us to kind of flagellate ourselves and they just want us to say, um, you know, we do nothing but bad news and they, they really actually, of course I wouldn't have said this, but they really don't understand what journalism involves and they don't understand what's a good story and they don't understand uh, how we have to uh, uh, afflict the comfortable and, and comfort the afflicted. I mean, they just don't get it. They're going to kind of, you know, they're just kind of, you know, we're going to get this kind of same old thing that we kind of do a drizzle of, uh, of doom and gloom and, uh, and make everyone kind of feel miserable and we're going to feel uh, beaten up and, uh, and reviled and rejected and I'm going to leave uh, kind of feeling, you know, uh, not so great. That's what I would have said four years ago. And actually, guys, four years on, I'm sort of in that position. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not quite, not quite, but... But it, it's, it's interesting being on the other side because I actually can see in a way that I never could when I was at The Economist or Newsweek or Time, uh, I can see how the you guys do nothing but doom and gloom thesis comes along. And let, let, me, let, me, give you, let me give you an example. And apologies to, uh, to um, uh, people who've heard this story already this morning in my plenary. If you'd put all of you together 15 years ago in 2000 and assumed that every single one of you is an expert on HIV AIDS and I had been moderating a conference and I'd said to you, what's going to happen in the next 15 years? Every one of you, I promise, every one of you would have said, it's going to be an unstoppable global pandemic. It's going to wipe out huge chunks of, uh, of, uh, of the middle class in African countries. There's almost certainly a hidden burden of disease in India and China. Uh, the only economic benefit that's going to come from AIDS is coffin makers, and in particular, <laughs> you know, children's coffin makers. It's going to be terrible, right? So 15 years on, I can, I can say, and I say it, you know, practically every week uh, in one forum or another, we can see the beginning of the end of AIDS. That's amazing. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. We can see the beginning of the end of AIDS. We can see the beginning of the end of AIDS. There is no reason why any woman uh, in the rich world, right now, why any woman in the rich world should give birth to an HIV positive baby. None, none whatsoever. And within 10 years, 15 years, there will be no reason why anyone, any woman in the poor world should give birth to an HIV positive baby either. In other words, we can eliminate mother to child transmission real, real quick. In 2003, in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, there were 50,000 people on life-saving antiretroviral drugs. 50,000 people in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa 12 years ago. There are now 9 million. That's 9 million lives saved. These are extraordinary stories. I can repeat the same in terms of deaths from malaria. I can repeat the same in terms of the reduction of extreme poverty. I can repeat the same the thing that Bill Gates always says, the kind of most beautiful chart in the world uh, of deaths of those, of kids under five. So in 1990, about 12 and a half million kids under five a year globally die before they're five. Now, 6.3 million. We've halved it in, in 20 years. There's absolutely no reason on God's green earth why we can't halve it again in the next 15. No reason whatsoever. These are extraordinary things. These are extraordinary things that have happened in our world. Uh, in the last 15 years, which is why I call it, you know, and this is my plenary a, a while ago, it's why I call it the age of miracles. But honestly, you know, for, for, for someone who runs an organization trying to get that news out, it's really difficult, actually. It's really, it's quite difficult. You know, I have kind of few heroes uh, who I can rely on to tell that news. Nick Kristof, God bless him, you know, will uh, we'll kind of trot it out uh, in the New York Times, and thank God he does, and a few others. But it's really, really difficult to get that story out. Moreover, second example, how do we keep that age of miracles going? Well, we keep it going by making sure that we put continued pressure on politicians to keep the promises that they have made 
to provide resources to defeat extreme poverty, to defeat, defeat malnutrition, defeat preventable disease, and so on and so forth. This year, I'm telling you this, none of you know it, this year, you know, we will have by the end of this year the greatest set of international agreements uh, on how to build a new development agenda since the Bret Bretton Woods agreements created the UN, World Bank, International Monetary Fund, Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the end of World War II. 2015 is that big. It's that big. We're going World Bank IMF meetings in Washington next week. That leads to an epochal G7 in Germany in, uh, in uh, early July. That leads to a once in a 20 year conference in Addis Ababa. You haven't heard any of this uh, on financing for development and in late July. That leads to a once in a generation effort to put together a new sustainable development agenda at the UN in, uh, in New York in September. And that then leads to a climate change conference in Paris in December, which you probably have heard of, but you haven't heard of the rest. But at the end of it, at the end of it, we will have internet, we will have international agreements. We will have international agreements, which if you guys do the job uh, of keeping politicians up to the mark, uh, will genuinely help us build a better world in which we can find the resources, in which we can find the political will uh, to tackle uh, systemic, uh, systemic issues. I had breakfast yesterday with a guy who used to work for me, uh, who's now one of the managing editors of Quartz, which, you know, is the hot right now global business and global economy website. And a fantastic product, actually. I mean, really great. And, you know, I was telling him all this stuff, and he said, I didn't know any of that. I said, man, <laughs> you know, if you don't know it, you know, if you don't know it and you don't get it out to people, I mean, how am I going to get it out to people? So um, I'm sorry, guys that I've sort of put myself now in the mm -hmm. camp of uh, slightly sympathetic <laughs> with those who think <laughs> that journalists do nothing but doom and gloom, but that's where that's, I am. That's got to do what a man's got to do. It's, there you go, <laughs> Richard. Good. Well, actually, I've learned a lot. I left, I left media about the same time right. Michael did and became a college professor. And I've, I've been fascinated by what gets covered and what doesn't get covered. And part of that is audience demand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to abandon my old positions completely. <laughs> but part of that is a structure we've allowed to build up. Um, one of my favorite things on the web is Charlie Pierce's analysis of the Sunday talk shows. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, <laughs> why on earth? Rick Santorum lost for re-election in Pennsylvania four years ago by 26 points. <laughs> Nobody, l Wendell Wilkie didn't lose by 26 <laughs> points. <laughs> <laughs> he has adopted, when he ran the first time against a wonderful man named Harris Wofford, he concealed the fact that he was anti-abortion and essentially a right-wing crazy. And, and I, I don't mean to denigrate nice right-wing crazies by mentioning <laughs> in the same breath with Rick Santorum. Uh, guess who was on the Moron Show with Chuck Todd this week? An interview with Rick Santorum. I think one of the worst things about the, the media in this country is that we allow people to turn into imbeciles the minute they cross the beltway. <laughs> and I, I'm talking about my, my former colleagues. I mean, I've known some really smart people who went to work in Washington bureaus and immediately got stupid. <laughs> you know, they immediately stopped following the pack. One of the things that uh, we don't see analyzed, we don't ever, we, you know, we don't see complicated stories because the people in the Beltway don't think you want a complicated story. Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Because I was instrumental in a lot of, uh, what do we call, oh, focus groups. Now, focus groups, you put a bunch of readers in a little room with a one-way mirror, and you watch them react to your product, and you ask them pointed questions about what they'd like to see. It's my experience that unless your focus group is put together by the most scientific psychologists in the world, you will probably have a group that tells you that your newspaper should have more large naked ladies astride Harleys. And that way, you would. Uh, it doesn't exactly give you usable knowledge, you know? Uh, 
we don't take into account and take seriously and analytically some real facts of life. Fear sells, for one thing. Fear sells in the media, but more importantly, fear sells at the ballot box. Bush and Rove sold fear. Mr. Netanyahu just sold some fear. Uh, in the media, I hate to confess this, but I was once a stringer for the National Enquirer. <laughs> But you got to go for the spectacular. I would write these really complicated and I think very intelligent, very well sourced medical stories. The editor would pound me to make sure I got all my facts right. And then he would turn the notes over to some crazy Aussie rewrite man who would turn it into a cancer cure. <laughs> all a part of the game, I guess. But. Fear, you know, when I think of the National Enquirer, there was a period in the 50s and early 60s where they sold Gru. Does anybody remember that? I will never forget a picture of a guy who ran off the road, hit a cyclone fence, and a pipe at the top went through his head, and they had a picture of it. They discovered that didn't work. So they, went, they invented celebrity news. But we, do, you know, we don't, we, do, we don't anymore analyze. You know, Michael's talking about complicated stories. How much have you seen about the U.S. initiative with China that isn't just based on how will the Republicans react? You know, everything's everything's a, an arm wrestling game as far as far as that coverage is concerned. How about the Iran deal? You know, how, how much do we know about that? You know, now we've, our Republicans have kicked us so, such sand. The Iranian supreme leader is saying, wait a minute, these guys, you know, these guys hate it. Maybe I don't like it. You know, who knows? Uh, we don't analyze things anymore, and I think it's because we assume the audience doesn't want it. Now, there's some data that might indicate that. What is popular on the web? You get to decide everything. You get to build your own newspaper. 20 years ago, that would have been impossible. So what gets built? Breitbart.com. Well, you know, that's not a news outlet. It's, it's, it doesn't go deeply into issues, no matter what its ideological point of view, you know? Uh, people have chosen to have their various prejudices reinforced, to have stories simplified to the point of idiocy for them. Um, the big question is, can you do that kind of analysis and make it work? The big problem for media nowadays is finding a business model that works. The people who screwed it up completely are laying off and firing people like Michael and me. <laughs> <laughs> and we're looking to them for the solutions. You know, it's one of my favorite theories that, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't mind that idiots were running the newspapers. You know, now it matters. <laughs> you know, now it matters because they're losing money hand over fist. But I think we have to change our responses. We have to uh, support that. There have been attempts of having uh, detailed coverage of the important stories. Uh, they mostly failed. Now, I don't know whether it's a failure of the entrepreneurship of the media people or whether it's the failure of the audience. I'm not one of those people who likes to blame the audience. I mean, you, you know, the audience asks for what it wants. We do our best to uh, give them both what they want and what they need. If they want a picture of Kim Kardashian's backside alongside my analysis of the, a, a cure for AIDS, I'll give them both of them. But I have to have an audience that wants, you know, that, that wants more than just uh, Kim's rump. Uh, dark news sells. You know, you, if you look at the campaign for, uh, for the Bush second term, Netanyahu's last campaign, it's, oh no, we're all going to die, I can save you. Run for your lives. Well, that works, you know. Uh, people keep saying sex sells. You ever notice when it sweeps time at a TV, sta TV station, they always find a, a ring of suburban housewife prostitutes to report on? You know, all the faces are all blurry. And <laughs> uh, but fear sells better. Fear sells better than sex. Fear sells better than anything. And as long as, as long as you're afraid and looking for a man on a white horse to rescue you, 
you, not, you won't have time to read these detailed analyses. You, you're you're going to be busy, you know, stocking up canned beans in the basement and loading your rifle and, and doing all that good stuff. So, I, you know, I think it's a mutual thing. You know, I think when the media mess shakes out, uh, there will, I have faith, there will be some, some place that tries to explain complicated stories. The question I have is anybody but Mike Elliott and I going to read it? <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, <clears throat> That was great, <laughs> and that was great also. So we'll see what happens here. Um, <laughs> I mean, these guys have been doing this for a long time. I'm kind of new to the game. I teach in the media studies department, and I have a show on the Progressive Voices Network, which is the new Air America, hopefully, and uh, on the Pacifica Network, but I'm kind of new to the game. Doom definitely sells, but I want to talk a little bit about the gloom part. <laughs> because they don't, you know, when you're watching the news, you never have a newscaster being like, there's like 40 people dead. They're not giving you the gloom. The gloom is what the audience takes away from just the straight reporting that comes at you in facts and figures and sound bites of how many are dead and how horrible it is, devoid of context, A, and I'm talking broadcast, so I'm from a broadcast perspective. Um, devoid of context because they only have four minutes before they have to sell you a bag of Doritos. So the advertising model is kind of a problem. Uh, <clears throat> Mom? <laughs> that, she's calling me. <laughs> um, the gloom part comes from the fact that they don't give you anything to do after the news. Being, okay, sure, an informed populace is integral to a healthy democracy. We already know that. That's probably why we are watching the news as responsible individuals. We were doing our part. But then what? They give you nothing to do. So my show, <clears throat> what we try to do is, um, uh, so if you're watching a, a half an hour no local news broadcast, you'll notice something that they do that's called um, thematic blocking or an emotional arc to the show. So all the fires go together, and then all the death stuff goes together. And then they worry you about what's in your cupboard that's gonna kill you, and then at the end they show you a cat that was you know, saved okay. from yeah. a local <laughs> fireman or something. That's what they call the emotional arc of the show. So that at the end, you don't want to kill yourself, and maybe you'll come back and watch again <laughs> tomorrow. Well, I think, and what I've been trying to do in conjunction with John, because my program is on his network, um, is trying to make that emotional arc, trying to make the news accessible emotionally to those of us who either have outrage fatigue or, well, outrage fatigue, is a phrase that I coined, because, and I think we all know what it means. I don't think it requires expl explanation, but you can watch the news, be outraged, and then what? You're left with outrage, which then, if you're a psychology major or even a minor, you know that any anger, if it's not expressed, it, or it either turns inward on the self, it makes people feel disempowered. It's not like they're saying at the end of some news story, if you want to deal with this, if, if you are concerned about money and politics, go talk to the move to amend people. They're really doing some good work on the ground and they could use your help, you know, and, and getting you together as a community with like-minded people. The news could be useful in that way. It could be useful in that way. Um, so my husband and I were always talking about the fight or flight uh, syndrome, syndrome, which, by the way, is the opposite of the rest and digest. <laughs> So you're either in one or the other, <laughs> so, uh, or somewhere in between. But that's basically the sympathetic nervous system versus the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, <clears throat> when you're in flight or flight, blood shunts to your muscles because you have to run and you, fear is happening. If I am being bombarded with fearful images, and not only is it the story that's fearful, like if it's a climate change story about how there's no water left in California, well, <laughs> or, the, you know, or, okay, they have a year's worth, whatever. We'll figure it out. I don't live there. Um, I care, though, I care. Um, 
if, all, if there's nothing for me to do with that feeling that gets brought up, not only by the stories, but Fox News specifically is, um, they are just, they have a horrible reputation for using techniques that drum up fear, right? They use, and I'll give you the top three, moving graphics. Okay, we're human beings, right? We're supposed to be living in a cave in the woods where anything that goes by fast you want to look at because it might be dangerous. That is how our brains have not caught up to being able to watch Fox News without having <laughs> some sort of... They know this. It's not like, oh, well, what a coincidence it is. We'll just have moving graphics all of the time. Constantly. They use breaking news alerts. You guys probably all know this already. For things like J-Lo J and Ben are getting a divorce. <laughs> the breaking news alert came from the Columbine, when Columbine happened. They started with their breaking news alerts and then they slowly started to erode into using them for things like celebrity entertainment news. Right. Not, <laughs> why, why must I be terrified? Yeah, CNN, the plane, the plane, Wolf Blitzer's the plane. Yes, exactly. Now, Fox isn't the only, you know, people jumped on board. They said, hey, look, Fox is doing really well. Why don't we use those techniques, right? So there, there it requires, if you're actually going to watch these channels, it requires a tremendous amount of presence to be like, okay, I'm not buying into the moving graphic. I see the moving graphic. What's the story here? What's the story? And I would even argue from being a psychotherapist that the, the vocabulary that is used, there's a thing called nonviolent discussion or nonviolent rhetoric, nonviolent talk. They use the opposite. It's all basically very subliminal, violent ways of discussing. They cut people off, etc. This is jarring to the nervous system. So, I'm, you know, I don't want to be down. Well, I am kind of down on Fox. Sorry, I don't think they're doing a public service. And it, I know there's some Fox contributors here at our, um, our, our beloved panel, but uh, they seem ni like nice people, but uh, they seem to be no, involved <laughs> in something nefarious, you know? <laughs> He's retired. He can say that. I still have to get on Nansen TV. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Okay, so finally, one thing that leaves us, uh, that I find when I'm talking to my students, um, that leaves, that is an enormous failure that, that contributes to the doom and gloom, is this sense of overwhelm we get when we're watching the news. Okay, so <clears throat> I don't know if you guys know this, but when you're like a contributor to some channel, They'll call you up, regardless of what you know anything about, and say, hey, can you come in on Wednesday and talk about this and this and this? Well, one day they called me and asked me if I could please talk about the Crimea situation. That's what they were going to talk about. That's what they wanted me, a media studies and show host, to come in and talk about. And I was like, <laughs> I had tried to avoid, I, you can't learn everything about everything, I find. So when that situation happened, I was like, I'm not doing that one. I'm sorry. I'm going to leave that to someone else who has some background in Russian politics and Eastern European. I'm just, I can't, I'll get a general sense, but I really can't go deeply in to have a conversation that's going to be useful to a viewing audience. I checked that off the list and that's what they wanted. So I said no, which is very hard. It's very hard to say no to an appearance because one leads to another and you know, you got to pay the rent. The issue here is that the viewing audience also is, unless you're watching the news every single night and following and have a history you know, in, in uh, uh, education and an enormous amount of subjects that's very deep and wide, you cannot really follow what is going on. So what does the brain do? It scans for the takeaway, and the takeaway is always something terrible is happening. In fact, I'm going, I might pick some brains over here to say, well, if you guys know where the good news is, why don't we put that on my show and we can launch a whole new you know, trajectory? Because I do find that people, I take calls on the show and they call in and generally they say, um, your show is listenable. You know, they say, I don't leave feeling totally depressed, but I do give the bad news. And when there is bad news, I also give people something to do, which I think is you know, a service. If they want to do something, there is something. You can call Chuck Schumer, because we're in New York. You can call him and yell at him about whatever. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I think, oh, and uh, finally, from the, from the, I mean, the doom and gloom thing, 
I'm sort of working at cross purposes against myself because because most of the news is doom and gloom, when you are funny or when you are a comedian, you're like a breath of fresh air in an otherwise horrible... Are we watching John Oliver? Did you guys see John Oliver and what he did? He went to talk to Edward Snowden and they explained something I didn't understand because they used... The idea of if you're geni- a picture of your genitals, wh- would you like to keep that private? And then he went through <laughs> exactly what each part of the documents that he revealed meant. Because people aren't, can, you know, your average American citizen is not at a conference like this. They're working hard to pay the bills and keep food on the table. Not that you're not, but just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I had him and I lost him. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> so she's a treasure. <laughs> and uh, now you know what it's like trying to get her off the telephone. <laughs> oh, just so she's the Colombo of radio hosts. Oh, just one more thing. Um, uh, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, first, a little inside baseball. If you do as I did and show up late to the meeting for one of these panels, you will wind up either going first or last. Right. You never somehow wind up in the middle. That's real inside baseball. Um, you, d- you don't want to go first if you don't know anything about the subject matter because you want to play off the other panelists. And you don't want to go last if you know everything about the subject matter because everything will have already been said, <laughs> even though not everyone will have already said it. Uh, uh, how many of you were with Juliana and I yesterday morning in that newsroom thing? So, uh, good. So just a couple of is there there because there, there there might be a little overlap, and I think that it's that it's worthwhile. But um, uh, before I go much further, I, I want to say that everybody here who does not own a T-shirt that says O N E on it one needs to hand Michael twenty five dollars. <laughs> because he's doing the Lord's work. I mean, these guys are doing real, real, really important work, and you can get a, uh, you can get a really spiffy T-shirt out of them. Um, Thank you, Joe. It's, 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 it's a good thing. Um, all right, so, you know, the thing about the media is that the media loves to talk about itself. Here we are. Um, and I guess it's always been this way, but now we have celebrity media, now we have media on media, but the real fact of the matter is, and I presume the reason that this panel is named the way that it is named is because we are freaking merchants of doom. Mm-hmm. And, and that is not to say more than the fact that we have commercialized doom and we merchandise doom because doom sells. There is research from the 1960s that was conducted by the Allstate Insurance Company. Uh, They used to do insurance that was framed by a sunny day and a beautiful family, and life was terrific, and they didn't sell a lot of insurance policies. And then they got a little more sophisticated in their research and they discovered that if you show the same family but the backdrop is their home burning to the ground, <laughs> that you will sell insurance policies. Um, the, the advertising adage that came from that is that hope for the future is always trumped by fear of loss. I think that this is a fundamental concept in media. And and you have to remember, and and I'm speaking primarily of what we have historically referred to as the mainstream news operations. So when you think about a CBS or NBC or uh, the Los Angeles Times or the Chicago Tribune, uh, these are things that they know. Uh, they don't, you, you, you know, above the fold in the New York Times, you are not going to see puppies. Um, uh, the lead story on Channel 7 Action News in whatever market you live in is never going to be uh, the outstanding student from the local high school who saved that lady's cat. Uh, it is always going to be a chalk outline and a blood stain. It's always going to be a house fire, an apartment fire. Um, if it bleeds, it leads is something that we have said in our business for a really long time, and there's a, there's a reason for it. 
the commercial media exists, uh, sadly, uh, I don't want to burst any bubbles, but the commercial media exists exclusively to, uh, to, to enrich itself. Uh, it exists not to entertain you or even to inform you. If they get lucky and do that every once in a while, well, hallelujah. But that's not why they're there. So the onus falls on you, my friends, as consumers of media. You, got, you know, it, it ain't 1952. Uh, you know, I love to tell this story. Uh, there's an organization called the National Association of Broadcasters, the NAB. And they have, in recent years, simply become a lobby. You know, they, they're, they're just pressing Congress to, uh, uh, to, to advance their commercial interests. It was not always this way. It's much like the NRA, which is the gun manufacturer's lobby. You know, don't confuse yourself and think that it's there to support gun owners. It's there to sell the damn guns. Uh, the, the, and again, it was not always so. That's not why the NRA came into being. It's not why the NAB came into being. The NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters, Back in the days when television stations signed off after Johnny Carson or what have you, the TV station, and I say this especially to the students in here, the, T yeah, the TV stations went dark uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the end of the broadcast day, and they didn't come back on until sunrise the next day. They played the national anthem, and the last thing you saw on the screen was a slide, and it was the NAB Code of Conduct. And every television station, every radio station adhered to the NAB Code of Conduct. And it said that we wouldn't lead with house fires and chalk outlines, basically. <laughs> I mean, it basically said that we're here to serve the public interest. And that as a responsible steward of the public good, that what, what, you know, what we're going to do with our television station every day is we're going to enlighten you and we're going to hold power accountable and we, are, uh, uh, we have been given this amazing, valuable gift of magnetics, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we have been awarded channel four. It uses up this much bandwidth in the electromagnetic spectrum and the government has allocated that to us and nobody else can use it. And our compact with you, the citizens, is that by taking this license for free and being allowed to sell, in those days, 12 commercials an hour and now 32, uh, it, it, uh, the compact that we've made with you is that we will inform, educate, and entertain in the public interest in exchange for your allowing us to make money off of a common resource. Well, somewhere in the last 50 years, that notion got pretty lost. And uh, w we were rewarded with the awful state of television programming that we have today. <laughs> and with the awful state of most radio programs that we have today, it's what spurred us to start Air America. It's what spurred me to, to push it off of television and take it onto the internet and uh, uh, in the form of progressive voices. Um, there was a general civility that the media recognized as the correct tone to strike and did so. But a common theme that I've found through my work in media, politics, and government is that over the last 15, 20, maybe 25 years, we have outsmarted ourselves. We have hired the best lawyers to beat the tax rules. We have hired uh, the smartest uh, researchers and strategists to conduct focus groups, yes, and some of them, Richard, absolutely correct, uh, some, some of them are so stupid that you can't believe <laughs> what you are sitting on the other side of the glass from. But over the course of these really complicated r research analyses, and now with uh, the internet, what's known as big data, we have gotten really, really good at separating the wheat from the chaff. We've gotten really good at figuring out what to put on the cover of People magazine uh, that's gonna sell more copies than what we chose not to put on the cover this week. And so there's this ongoing research. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, but one thing that all of us in media know if we run commercial media operations is that we need lots of people paying attention. And the way that we get people to pay attention is we are sensational because 
it's no longer effective for us to come on television and say, here's a very complicated story about oil, gas, transportation, and politics. <laughs> you know, I am so out of here for reruns of uh, Bachelor Father. It's, it, it, so, so, so we got really smart. And we, and we said, well, I'm never going to lead with that. I'm going to scare the crap out of you. And that is going to make you watch the soap commercial that comes up in another 35 seconds. So, so that's, that's really what goes on. Um, uh, um, I will tell you that I believe that there really is some hope here. And the reason that I believe that is for many, 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 many years, we had government enforced scarcity. The government allowed any radio or television operator to own seven AMs, seven FMs, and seven television stations. The biggest broadcasters owned a total of 21 stations. Well, over time, and through a lot of really heavy lobbying on the part of the NAB, uh, those ownership restrictions were lifted, government scarcity uh, for the broadcast licenses was expanded only to those who already owned them. And if you owned seven then, and you were Clear Channel, which is now called iHeart Media, uh, now you own 1,780 radio stations. Uh, if you were Sinclair Television and all you owned was WTVN Television in Columbus, Ohio, now you own 1,400 television stations. Well. What's known as share of voice has shrunk down to three or four companies. Uh, there are five major media conglomerates in the United States today, and they control pretty much everything that's on radio and television. So that's not good news. But the good news is, as media has evolved, and the, and the evolution of media is essentially AM, 1930s, FM, 1950s, XM, satellite radio, uh, 1990s, and now IP, Internet Protocol. There are two cameras in the back of this room. Everything that we're saying right now can be watched in uh, Kazakhstan right now, if you were so inclined. I don't know why you would do that. But I did not sign a release. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know why you would do that, but you could. Do you, are you an after member? So the, <laughs> so, the, so the fact of the matter is, IP, which is, which is Internet Protocol, is a democratic revolution in media. It is citizens media. It gives us the ability to take the Progressive Voices Network and completely do an end around Clear Channel and Cumulus, the two radio station owners that own virtually every radio station in America. And a day is coming, and not very far away, where you will sit down in your automobile, your connected car, if you will, and the center stack the entertainment stack that's in the middle of the front dashboard of your car will have a big screen, and many of you already have cars that have this screen. But on that screen will be some really valuable real estate. And you'll be able to select on that screen whether you want to listen to the traditional ABC, NBC, CBS, or if you would prefer to listen to or watch YouTube or Absurdity Today with Juliana Forlano, why wouldn't I make that plug, really? Um, uh, and then you run into a wall. That's, that's, right. that's, that's right. And then you run your car into a wall. Not for driving. Um, so, so, so we are about to see, if you think the internet is confusing now and you're not sure where to go, uh, and it lacks context, and then the smartphone came along and we have these lovely little apps on the smartphone, and those give us some context about, well, if I press this, I know I'm going to figure out where restaurants are or what have you. The same thing is coming to your car. And in five years, you won't be able to tell the difference between your radio, your television set, and your computer. It will all converge in what's known as IP, Internet Protocol. And then we'll see. We'll see who continues to have the power. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what, what prevails. The last thing that I want to say is, and I've said this before, and I've said it for a couple of years, but I, 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 but I say it every opportunity I get. In the old days, you could trust the media to generally bring you the news of the world, and it was pretty much the same, and you got the same take on everything, and it was not opinion-driven. Today, it is opinion-driven, and it is incumbent upon you to be your own editor. Yeah. 
and it is incumbent upon you to get out of your media silo and stop watching the news that you choose and start watching a little of everything. And as painful as it is, watch MSNBC and Fox News. Read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. It's, it, it, it's your obligation as a citizen of a democracy has, has, has the ante has been upped because there's so much media out there. So, and I'll, I'll close by saying, it's changed so much now and so much of it is worse, but a lot of it is better. There's The Daily Show. There's Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. These are, these, are, these, are, these are comedy shows that are more real than any of the worthless garbage that those guys were talking about on Sunday morning. Uh, yeah. and, they, and, they, and they don't, and, and, and John McCain doesn't appear on every single one of those shows. <laughs> Uh, there is a little <coughs> operation out of Toronto, Canada called Vice Media. Started life as a pulp magazine 20 years ago. It's a multi-billion dollar operation now and it does the best investigative journalism in the world. And HBO is about to give them a daily news show. It's Vice Media. Uh, Vice.com and you can go to HBO and see it. Al Jazeera America probably does the best day-to-day uh, straight up journalism that you will find broadcast. Uh, PBS has Frontline, which is one of the uh, greatest uh, investigative shows that has ever been. Uh, NPR is the only national news organization that hasn't been so decimated by the profit motive that they still have boots on the ground all over the world and therefore all things considered in the afternoon and morning edition in the, in, in, in the morning provide you uh, with, with, with amazing news coverage. Um, the, the, and, and, there, and there are many others. We're, there, we talked about Quartz, uh, w w you know, we, we should talk about BuzzFeed. Uh, anyway, lots of options, and the onus is on you to be the best media consumer that you can be. Otherwise, we will sell you doom and gloom. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Can I just can I just follow up? I mean, I I, I thought John's exegesis on uh, on what has happened to the media and particularly to the broadcast media over the last thirty years. I mean, really, I mean, you could you could bottle it up and sell it. I mean, that was just an absolutely fantastic description of where we've got. And 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 like you, I mean, I am actually uh, enormously uh, optimistic about. Uh, what enorm genuinely optimistic about what new technology uh, enables us to do, you know, let Juliana create an audience and lots of other people, it enables you to watch Al Jazeera English, which, you know, in, in my beat in sort of international development is kind of, you know, hands down the best, uh, the best channel uh, uh, that's, uh, that's presently available on your cable box. There's a slight but, though, in, in, uh, in the story, or it's not a but, it's just sort of let us, re let us appreciate though that this description of where we are now with all, you know, in, in, in my view, all its uh, optimistic aspects does mean, does imply, does, does recognize a massively fragmented audience <laughs> compared with the one at the start of John's exegesis. Uh, there's no going back to that. No. There's no going back to that. I wrote a book about this once many years ago, but there's no going back to that period between 1945 and the early 1970s when you had a, a whole set of extraordinarily strong, cohesive elements in American society of which just three national TV networks was one. Uh, there's no going back to that. So, I mean, there's no, we, we, we will never get back to an ability where somehow or other wise men can create an hour of civility in which, you know, a handful of wonderful executives, I don't think they were all wonderful, within a few blocks of each other in New York can sort of figure it all out. That's, that's gone. I mean, that's gone, dead, buried, it was very, you know, dead and buried 10 or 15 years ago, but my God, it's 12 feet under now. Uh, and it's not coming back. So although I absolutely agree, I absolutely agree 
that you know the the changing technology, changing and, and the the, inter the interplay of changing technology and consumer preferences is giving us huge opportunities to do other stuff. Do understand that the context in which that is it, it takes shape is 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 of a a context of disintermediation and fragmentation rather than cohesion and all of us agreeing what the same story is. Yeah, and I, I support that. I tell my students that. The internet is such a creature of fragmentation that it w became clear at the trial of Gary Glitter, for example, that he was in contact with virtually every pedophile on earth, right, yeah, yeah. you know, which is a tiny audience, but it, it's linked worldwide now. And I don't mean to do doom and gloom, it's just the first example I thought of. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's no longer Walter Cronkite. I wanted to back something that Juliana said. You know, John Wanamaker, the great merchant of the 19th century, once said, I, you know, I, I know I waste half of the money I spend on advertising, I just don't know which half. <laughs> and the John Wanamakers of today know a lot more. There's a lot more data. The advertising is more carefully targeted I'm old, I know I get a lot of Walker and uh, adult diaper <laughs> things on my Facebook page. <laughs> also, though, you're being manipulated by real scientists. How many of you have ever heard of Frank Luntz? Good. Frank Luntz is a brilliant uh, manipulator of words. Frank Luntz invented, instead of saying, for example, Let's tax a living crap out of rich people when they die, so we no longer have to look at people like Paris Hilton. <laughs> now you could sell that, could you? But you can't sell death panels, can or you can't sell death tax, can you? That's a Frank Luntz invention, death tax. Frank Luntz gave a list of words for Newt Gingrich to use in the halls of Congress they may be the words that have brought us to the absolute catastrophe of government we have now. These are all words that every good Republican was supposed to use to describe Democrats. And it worked. It is quite scientific. You are not, you're not being uh, manipulated by 1928 PR tactic, tactics. What were those words, just out of curiosity? Oh, you know, evil, you know, just nasty words. You know, yeah. never Dirty refer liberal, to a Democrat you know, <laughs> unless you're using the nasty words. Uh, the latest edition of one of my favorite books, Philip Knightley's The First Casualty, talks about how war is sold these days, and it's much more efficient. Nobody knows anything about the Falklands. Nobody knows very much at all about the first Iraq war. We know a great deal about Vietnam, but that taught the government something. You don't want people to know what's going on. Um, so you gotta realize that as the technology is perfected, so are the techniques of the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, I think it bears saying um, one of our other panelists uh, on another panel was talking about this, and I've experienced this myself, where when you go on TV, they say, now you're going to talk about this. I don't want you agreeing with this other guy who's going to be taking this stand. You are here to defend this stand. So what, what kind of effect does that have on the audience? Well, it suggests that we're always fighting and that it's only fighting. And it might make for good TV, but I think... What the network means by good TV and what you might mean by good TV are two different things. What the network means is, are your eyeballs glued to this thing? And once you're afraid or you're trying to figure something out, yes, your eyeballs are kind of glued to it. Your brain gets involved and then it has a sort of um, addictive feedback loop of staying <laughs> in the fear until you can figure out the way out. And Which you always weird. know when it's a print person being interviewed on radio or TV because that's the person who says, I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Uh, public radio for years had Daniel Shore on on Saturday mornings. Right. Daniel Shore was by then about 175 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and they would ask Dan Shore about anything. You know, the 
Balkans, the Soviet Union, the Russian Orthodox mm -hmm. Church, how to keep your basement from flooding. And he <laughs> always had an answer. Yeah. And it always sounded pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> And I have a feeling he didn't have a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> I think he did, actually. Uh, but, it, but it's true. It's, it's absolutely it's just true. A it's clue. Yeah, just a, yeah, maybe just a small clue. So one thing that uh, this reminds me, uh, w one thing that you should be on the lookout for as you consume media is an advent of the last 10 years, and it's called false equivalence. And I think it's self it's self-descriptive, but it bears this much explanation. 20 years ago, if you watched a television program where they interviewed a Holocaust survivor, it was not necessary for them to <laughs> then interview a Holocaust denier. Or a Nazi. Or a Nazi. Or a Nazi, <laughs> right? So, in the, and I don't know, because I don't teach journalism, but somewhere along the line, in yeah. the interest of fairness and balance, apparently, we have decided that all sides of a story need to be told. And you know what? Sometimes there, there, there aren't two sides. Sometimes there's just the truth. And uh, uh, you know who uh, turned me on to this was uh, uh, Al Franken who is now the senator from Minnesota, but was our afternoon talent on Air America. And uh, Al set the tone for Air America because he said, we will not lie. We'll let the chips fall where they will. We won't do false equivalents, and we will simply dedicate ourselves to the truth. And when we look stupid, we'll look stupid. But no one, now I didn't know at this moment in 2003 that he was gonna run for the Senate. And uh, Al is one of the smartest people you will ever meet. And he had calculated this. And he knew that everything he was going to say on the radio for the next two years was going to be fodder for his opponent in a Senate campaign. And he felt that, that, that his truth-telling needed to extend to the rest of the staff. And he sat everybody down. He was, he was certainly the senior person. And, and, and he said, we have to tell the truth. And I don't care how stupid it makes us look. And now I recognize in retrospect that he wanted to get elected and he just wanted to make sure he wasn't giving opposition research any fodder. But it turns out to have been a pretty good thing. Yeah. You know, it turns out to be a pretty good thing to just tell the truth. So, you, you, you know, watch for false equivalents. Also, you know, that, that, that he's, he's dead right about that. But it, it's within the beltway, the simplification of everything to a binary issue. You know, if a Democrat says uh, global climate change is a problem and a Republican stands up and says, my friends from Venus have told me that we should bomb <laughs> Iran, they get equal balance. And, you know, I think it's insanity. I don't think a journalism school is going to teach that crap. You know, that's not, <laughs> that's not balance. That's in insanity. Well, I think it, it does bear saying that Fox News is basically a propaganda arm of the right wing, and then they have kind of poisoned the broadcast environment. I think people here probably know that already because you're here. So that's, but it does, it, it's not just like, oh, I don't know how we eroded into this. No, it's by design to, to keep people, you know, coming back to Fox and to really poison the media environment. And they have been incredibly successful, but we do have good news on the front, not to leave you with the doom and gloom, but um, you know, net neutrality did just pass the FCC, I think, or if, yeah. yeah. A good thing. So that is a, a huge thing. deal. Of course, corporations are gonna now sue and take it to some other, daddy, can we destroy this so I can have my big It's gonna again? kill us all. Net They're neutrality gonna try. will kill us all. But we have it for now, which is important. And, you know, I always like to solve problems once and for all. I think it's like a tick or something like we're done. But as it turns out, this whole media landscape is evolving. And as much as Fox News has poisoned the dialogue, the Internet has come up and there have been some positive things coming and launching out of the Internet. Independent media sites can work with a lot less overhead than they would have to if they had to buy you know, all the overhead of old, old timey days. I think you were mentioning that yeah. in the former panel. So as many horrible things are happening, there are also positive things uh, happening. I think it bears saying. 
Um, so if we had, do we have any questions from the audience? We have about 20 more minutes. All right. Wow. Here we go. I'll just warm you up. When Juliana was talking about the blood rushing, I thought she was going to explain how men get stupid, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was implicit. <laughs> Okay. So uh, could you contrast the phenomenon you're talking about? Is this strictly limited to the United States? Uh, can you contrast, say, with Canada and Western Europe? Uh, I'll simply say, and I, I have a feeling that Michael has more expertise than I do, but I'll simply say that from a broadcast uh, regulatory perspective, uh, Canada is a lot tighter than we are not happening there the way it's happened here. Uh, and I can't speak to the rest of the world, but fortunately Michael's here. Well, I, no, I think that's right. Uh, there are different regulatory regimes uh, in place in, uh, in different societies which, which, uh, uh, which limit um, uh, you know, various, uh, various aspects uh, of uh, media dis decline. Hmm. Um, Can I? Uh, but but uh, I, I think that when you look at technological forces and social change, the, uh, uh, the, the history of the last 200 years uh, is not that uh, America experiences things alone, yeah. uh, but it's that exper America experiences them first. I Ask mean, any I, Canadian, they'll bore the hell <coughs> out of you with what it's like to be next door to us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember being at a conference in India a few years ago uh, where um, the Indians were kind of congratulating themselves, Indians on a panel were congratulating themselves uh, because they had, they had within the last five years, when the market was de, de, de um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Re regu de deregulated, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, had set up 25, um, or something like that, uh, all news channels. And an advertising guy, guy was uh, on the panel, and he said, look, he said, you know, you're all doing great. He said, let me just tell you, in 10 years' time, you're all going to be out. You know, <laughs> you're all going to be out. Because exactly what has happened to advertising uh, in the United States and elsewhere is going to happen in India too, and you, you're all going to be out of business. So, um, so yeah, I think there are there are differences, but um, I think you know the kind of technological wave that's that's washed over the United States will wash over everyone sooner or later. Okay, another question. Next. Um, yes. Um, one of the last things you ended with was that it seems to be like a a poisoned um, media environment. And I wondered, um, how do you change that sort of poison media environment? Um, I was thinking back to the 2012 presidential campaign and how um, Colorado is a swing state and all the states that weren't swing states were not flooded by the media with all this political advertising. Yeah. But if you lived here, it was like every other ad was Barack Obama is a horrible person and he's going to destroy everything. <laughs> or <laughs> Mitt Romney is this awful person and he's going to destroy everything. And it was just, it became inundated with this, it was never ending. And so I wonder, um, like, how do you stop this feedback cycle? Well, the obvious answer isn't quite possible because the visual media make a lot of their money, most local stations make a lot of their money during the political campaigns. Yep. So you're gonna get massive resistance to any attempt to regulate that kind of advertising. In the UK, and I will turn to my friend with the obvious accent, there are limitations <laughs> on uh, advertising and the time spent in a build up to a campaign. Yeah, and they're very strict. Very strict. So, yeah. you know, if that could happen here, that would be a good thing, but I don't think it can. No. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the, Richard's exactly right. The winner is the television industry. They've set it up this way, and as uh, citizens, we have a couple of choices. One, we can turn off the television, and if I lived in a swing state, I would. And two, we can lobby our congressional representatives to change the damn rules. Let's get money out of electoral politics. I mean, that seems obvious, doesn't it? And l let's, let's, let's publicly fund these campaigns, and that is the only answer, but I'm gonna just tell you that it's tough because the NAB, now the lobby for the television industry, they are tough, and that's a lot of money. Okay, question here. 
Yeah, and also just, you know, Frank Luntz coined the term uh, climate change because global warming was too scary. Um, but my question, you brought up money and politics, and I was going to ask a uh, tag on to that, actually, and money and media, and what your experiences have been, maybe stories uh, not being covered because how it might influence a corporate sponsor uh, and how it influences the media in your experiences. Uh, I'll, I'll just go real fast. I feel like I'm doing too much talking here. Um, Comcast owns most of the cable systems in America and is about to merge with Time Warner and then they'll own virtually all the cable systems in America. Comcast also the single biggest ISP, the biggest provider of internet service, Comcast. Comcast owns NBC. Tell me if the run-up to the FCC's decision to uh, uh, regulate the internet to the extent that it remained free and open, uh, net neutrality they call it. Tell me if anywhere on any NBC television station you saw a single news story about net neutrality or the yeah. details of it. Yeah. And that is your answer, you know. Uh, they, they own the rails, they own the boxcars, and now they own everything that goes in the boxcars. So. But it's also kind of okay, because, I'm, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to leave everyone panicked, John, sorry. But I, I think that there I, are... I work so hard at this. And <laughs> I think that there are... Um, the issue is we have to be willing to change as a society. We have to... Be, we have to it's just like, you know, you have to become aware that w of what's happening, that the news is not really trustworthy on broadcasts, at least, uh, because of exactly what was said, because they are all, if you're watching them on your television, they are beholden to corporate interests. And I hate to scare everyone, but the study that said that people who watch Fox News are less uh, aware of what's going on, uh, 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 informed, <laughs> that they did that study on MSNBC too, and they got the same result. Yep. So trying to take a deep yeah. breath, <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of disturbing. So, um, I, I mean, the, I, I believe it's already been said here, but also join these groups, free speech. You know, there's a great group called, I think, freespeech.org. They are, they will give you the news about what's happening on net neutrality. You kind of have to, again, got, you have to go find it. You can't. Um, just kind of sit back and let it come to you like we once, like and we once you did. have to be aware that it's gonna change. That, I, I remember as a little kid, Jack Benny was on every Sunday night at 7 or 7.30. I listened to Jack Benny every Sunday night. Then I got a little older, Top 40 radio came in and I listened to screaming DJs playing the Top 40. Then so-called progressive radio came in and I listened to people as stoned as I was playing long Grateful Dead tracks. <laughs> which I kind of enjoyed a great deal. <laughs> and now I turn on my radio in the morning and my satellite radio brings me the wonderful Elizabeth Cook on Outlaw Country. You know, so it's not exactly a vivid example of news coverage, but it's an example of how all these media change whether we like it or not. Yeah. 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 We have another question over here. Um, <clears throat> you've talked a lot about the gorilla in the room, which is the commercial media, but I haven't heard much about non-commercial media. There are newspapers like The Guardian in, in, in the UK, which are endowed, you know, and don't have to scramble for advertiser money. Is that a, a better model for trying to shore up the newspaper media business with organizations that are non-profit and endowed so that they can be, uh, you know, free of these kinds of commercial pressures? Uh, half of my closest friends work for The Guardian, but that's mm -hmm. not actually not an accurate description okay. of The Guardian. I mean, The Guardian does, is, indeed, uh, is indeed under the, the governance of a trust, uh, but it conducts itself absolutely as a commercial organization and, in fact, has for many, many years uh, been subsidized by another part of the organization, which is called Motor Vehicle Trader, uh, which does exactly what you would think it does. In other <laughs> words, it helps you buy cars. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so although I think it helps uh, to have a, uh, a trust ownership, um, and I think that has been genuinely useful in, uh, in The Guardian's case, I worked for The Economist for 10 years, which is not actually owned by a trust, but the editor is appointed by a trust, so the editor doesn't uh, have any relationship with the, with the board of directors. I think that was a useful thing to do as well. But in both those cases, that believe me, they are cutthroat uh, commercial operations. Over here. 
I've noticed as a reasonably educated individual a dumbing down of news across the spectrum from far left to far right. My question is, is that the media responding to the people or the media creating that? Wow. That's a good question. It's a great question. It's it's a great great question. question. It's like the chicken and the egg. I don't know. It's <laughs> a great question. Yeah, it seems, uh, it, 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 it seems as though it's a vicious circle. Uh, go, go read a high school senior's uh, senior thesis and, and you know, try not to warm, run a warm bath and get in it and slit your wrists. I mean, uh, I, I, I mean we, 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 have lo we have really lost this literacy that is essential to our understanding what's going on around us. And uh, it is a vicious circle in the media, which, again, what is the media interested in? It sells commercials, and it needs as many warm bodies mm -hmm. as it can mm -hmm. garner to sell to, and if it has to dumb itself down in the process, it will, and therefore it just goes like this. It's, it's ugly. Well, I also work for listener-sponsored radio, so we don't take any commercials or any endow... We don't... We get... No well, it's great, but, you know... My salary is quite low. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just saying. So I mean, but yes, that's you know. Absolutely. And it's. I think it's because I. I th I'm hoping that this catches on. You know, I'm sure all of you have an e email get like a re get like a Kickstarter request for twenty dollars every day now because that is a big deal. But people are, you know, we're so used to. Sure, we pay our cable bill, but we don't think about paying our news coverage, mm. the news that we watch. But now we need to start becoming aware that if there is a trusted news source that is not ad-sponsored, throw them five bucks every couple of months. You, if everyone did, yeah. there'd be an entire, I would be fine. You know what I mean? So we're always, it's, it's not that great to have your, your staff like concerned about, you know, whether to go on welfare. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and people who are working without the greatest of, of support, um, I would argue that unless they are saints, they are kind of easily corruptible, right? right. Because you need to eat. You need to feed your kids. You need to do all these things. So um, with that changing media model, I would encourage people to... to Make that little contribution. You, I know you never had to in the past, but now things are basically different. It's a really important point, actually, I think. And it kind of goes with the fragmentation point that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, there are, uh, you know, there are huge opportunities. There are people like Juliana and hundreds and hundreds of them who are using new technology to kind of get messages out. But be in no doubt, you know, fragmentation means that these are small operations. I mean, God bless you know, the attempts to put things together and, and kind of build, you know, bigger organizations uh, that's, been, that's been done. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a really important point. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who are kind of doing the last work on not much pay. And re realize you pay for everything. You know, if you have a cable system, you are actually paying for the weird-looking guys in derby hats jumping up and down on pogo sticks network. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, yeah, you are. It, you it's are. all there. Yeah. You're paying for You're all paying of it. You're paying for a lot, yeah. Okay. Another question? Yes, Hi. Uh, I was uh, wondering about uh, the role of the media as an investigative arm and an educational arm. I guess uh, I recently read this Doris Kearns book on Taft, Roosevelt, and... McClure and uh, was impressed by the depth of investigation into trusts, uh, railroad monopolies. Nobody seems to be doing that in the press these days. And this was a way in which public opinion was modified. It was an important arm of education of the public in a democracy. Well, that's, that's, who is taking uh, this place? That's part of my academic concentration, and we're talking about mm -hmm. the progressive era, and we're talking about the era of Ida Tarbell and all those wonderful people. I think if you want to look to the examples like that, much as I hate to advertise a friend, Lou DeBose's uh, <laughs> Washington Spectator has a wonderful story about the treatment of veterans of the Iraq War currently. The thing is, you have to look for that stuff. I mean, in the progressive era, the magazines that Tarbell and Steffens and all those people worked for, they were everywhere. They, they were the popular media of the day. Now you're going to have to look for it. Yeah. It's, it's media fragmentation. It's out there. You have to find it. Yeah. 
Also in the whatever happened to, my first job in the late 70s was with the station KTTV in Los Angeles as staff producer, my first job. And the six owned and operated stations of Metro Media. And my job basically was to keep their license by producing community-oriented yes. programming. That's and I right. went around the community, and I spoke to the elderly, and I spoke to every, and we made documentaries. Uh, Feeling of Destiny, Black Women Leaders in the Spirit of Martin Luther King. Uh, From Lucy to Maud, The Changing Image of Women in Television. I mean, all that kind of, but they needed it, otherwise they'd lose their license. What happened to it? St. Ronnie <laughs> saved us from that. Yeah. 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 Please expand. Yeah. No, well, you know, it's like the fairness doctrine. Yeah. There used to be a requirement, uh, uh, even on television, there used to be television editorials, and you had the right to respond to them. And there was that community requirement you're talking about in order to keep your license. But, the, but then, you know, on fire came uh, St. Ronnie on his white horse, and the deregulation flag was waved, and there's no longer that requirement. The Fairness Doctrine, the end of the Fairness Doctrine is what brought us Rush Limbaugh and Michael Savage and all those idiots. Um, so uh, I don't really, you know, I, I know what happened to that. You know, and it was a deliberate political choice made by the United States government yep. uh, for uh, ideological reasons. Juliana, I love how you're empowering audiences to, you know, engage hard stories. I'm wondering, are there other outlets or? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Fair enough, I can leave now. Don't change um, the dial. That are actually focusing on positive stories and is that requiring a different business model? I know you talked That's about kind great of Great question. Audience. I don't know, I just kind of am who I am, right? Uh -huh. So I, I started as a comedian and a therapist. And now I'm, a, I'm the voice of, of independent news in New York City on 6 o'clock every Monday through Thursday. So I'm coming from that perspective, you know, and I, I see the problem, I see the gloom and doom that is created by the system of how we practice media. And I, I have my little plot of land and I say, well, we're not doing that over here. You know, I'm like the, the non... Uh, Native American killing Christopher Columbus. You know, I'm like, I have my little space, and I'm gonna, we're gonna do it a little differently uh, over here. So I love I your don't know. combination. If a joke bombs, <laughs> did you then comfort the audience? Or? Exactly. <laughs> no, actually, I would bring a journal on stage with me, and if the audience didn't laugh, I'd be like, hi. Give me a quick minute. And, uh, <laughs> it didn't go well. Why do you laugh. think that joke didn't work? <laughs> Do you mind? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Oh, okay. We, we only have time for one more question, I'm afraid, so we're going to squeeze in the last one from this young man over here. Okay. I might, I might be kind of treading on repetition here, but um, you were speaking about how IP is kind of the, the thing now in the revolution, and it seems like um, for young journalists who are kind of thinking about um, starting a new model, um, the question is, um, I believe it was Juliana who mentioned there were like four, tech, four techniques or three techniques that kind of are fear-inducing and, and just kind of don't help. Um, can you guys think of any, anything that you'd like to see that isn't being done in terms of very specific, um, say, people not talking over each other in terms of the opposition of creating that kind of angsty thing? Uh, what kind of elements would you guys like to see from new well, journalism? I like to use humor because Bill Moyers, God bless Bill Moyers, but you do kind of leave depressed and... <laughs> <laughs> you leave a little bit depressed and more educated, but also, don't. you know, uh, you know, people don't want young people don't watch it if it's not in snippets. Generally, generally speaking, so to be able to sort of package the information is an art for the new brain is an art form, and I think humor is the way to go. And people are calling me. First of all, people are calling me and saying, "Hey, the election's coming up." Uh, do you want to come and do n the news with humor over here and over here and over here? So I think that's a big thing. Um, J John Stewart has, has uh, set the tone for that, and hopefully that will be a way. I don't know if I'm exactly answering your question, but I think, that, I think humor helps. Well, let me give you a piece of a CWA answer. If you wanted to think that the, the uh, be told 
that the, the Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives was dumb as a sack of hammers. <laughs> if, would you, would you accept it if you, heard, you read Molly Ivan's immortal line, if he gets any dumber, we're gonna have to water him twice a day? <laughs> <laughs> Humor works. Right. Well, on that note, we're going to end. Thank you all so much for coming. It was great. Thank you. I love you. <laughs>